The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 3 The Headless Humans. Above the roof of the palace that housed the Jed of Gathol and his entourage, the cruiser Vanator tore at her stout moorings. The groaning tackle bespoke the mad fury of the gale, while the worried faces of those members of the crew, whose duties demanded their presence on the straining craft, gave corroborative evidence of the gravity of the situation. Only stout lashings prevented these men from being swept from the deck while those upon the roof below were constantly compelled to cling to rails and stanchions to save themselves from being carried away by each new burst of meteoric fury. Upon the prow of the Vanator was painted the device of Gathol, but no pennants were displayed in the upper works, since the storm had carried away several in rapid succession, just as it seemed to the watching men that it must carry away the ship itself. They could not believe that any tackle could withstand for long this titanic force. To each of the twelve lashings flung a brawny warrior with drawn short sword. Had but a single mooring given to the power of the tempest, eleven short swords would have cut the others. Since partially moored, the ship was doomed, while free in the tempest it stood at least some slight chance of life. "'By the blood of Isis, I believe they will hold!' screamed one warrior to another. "'And if they do not hold, may the spirits of our ancestors reward the brave warriors upon the Vanator,' replied another of those upon the roof of the palace. "'For it will not be long from the moment her cables part before her crew dons the leather of the dead. But yet, Tanis, I believe they will hold. Give thanks, at least, that we did not sail before the tempest fell.' since now each of us has a chance to live. Yes, replied Tanis, I should hate to be abroad today upon the stoutest ship that sails the Barsoomian sky. It was then that Gahan the Jet appeared upon the roof. With him were the balance of his own party and a dozen warriors of Helium. The young chief turned to his followers. I sail at once upon the Vanator, he said, in search of Tara of Helium, who is thought to have been carried away upon a one-man flyer by the storm. I do not need to explain to you the slender chances the Vanator has to withstand the fury of the tempest, nor will I order you to your deaths. Let those who wish remain behind without dishonor. The others will follow me. And he leaped for the rope ladder that lashed wildly in the gale. The first man to follow him was Tanis, and when the last reached the deck of the cruiser, there remained upon the palace roof only the twelve warriors of Helium, who, with naked swords, had taken the posts of the Gatholians at the moorings. Not a single warrior who had remained aboard the Vanator would leave her now. "'I expect it no less,' said Gahan, as with the help of those already on the deck he and the others found secure lashings. The commander of the Vanator shook his head. He loved his trim craft the pride of her class in the little navy of Gathol. It was of her, he thought, not of himself. He saw her lying torn and twisted upon the ochre vegetation of some distant sea-bottom, to be presently overrun and looted by some savage green horde. He looked at Gahan. "'Are you ready, Santothis?' asked the Jed. "'All is ready. Then cut away.' Word was passed across the deck and over the side to the Heliumetic warriors below that at the third gun they were to cut away. Twelve keen swords must strike simultaneously and with equal power, and each must sever completely and instantly three strands of heavy cable that no loose end fouling a block bring immediate disaster upon the Vanator. Boom! The voice of the signal gun rolled down through the screaming wind to the twelve warriors upon the roof. Boom! Twelve swords were raised above the twelve brawny shoulders. Boom! Twelve keen edges severed twelve complaining moorings, 
clean and has won. The Vanator, her propellers whirling, shot forward with the storm. The tempest struck her in the stern as with a mailed fist and stood the great ship upon her nose, and then it caught her and spun her as a child's top spins, and upon the palace roof the twelve men looked on in silent helplessness and prayed for the souls of the brave warriors who were going to their death. And others saw, from Helium's lofty landing stages and from a thousand hangars upon a thousand roofs, but only for an instant did the preparation stop that would send other brave men into the frightful maelstrom of that apparently hopeless search, for such is the courage of the warriors of Barsoom. But the Vanator did not fall to the ground, within sight of the city at least, though as long as the watchers could see her, never for an instant did she rest upon an even keel. Sometimes she lay upon one side or the other, and again she hurtled along keel up or rolled over and over, or stood upon her nose or her tail at the caprice of the great horse that carried her along. And the watcher saw that this great ship was merely being blown away with the other bits of debris great and small that filled the sky. Never in the memory of man or the annals of recorded history had such a storm raged across the face of Barsoom. And in another instant was the Vanator forgotten as the lofty scarlet tower that had marked lesser helium for ages crashed to the ground, carrying death and demolition upon the city beneath. Panic reigned. A fire broke out in the ruins. The city's every force seemed crippled, and it was then that the warlord ordered the men that were about to set forth in search of Tara of Helium to devote their energies to the salvation of the city, for he too had witnessed the start of the Vanator, and realized the futility of wasting men who were needed sorely if lesser helium was to be saved from utter destruction. Shortly after noon of the second day the storm commenced to abate, and before the sun went down the little craft upon which Tara of Helium had hovered between life and death these many hours drifted slowly before a gentle breeze above a landscape of rolling hills that once had been lofty mountains upon a Martian continent. The girl was exhausted from loss of sleep, from lack of food and drink, and from the nervous reaction consequent to the terrifying experiences through which she had passed. In the near distance, just topping an intervening hill, she caught a momentary glimpse of what appeared to be a dome-capped tower. Quickly she dropped the flyer until the hill shut it off from the view of the possible occupants of the structure she had seen. The tower meant to her the habitation of man, suggesting the presence of water and perhaps of food. If the tower was the deserted relic of a bygone age, she would scarcely find food there, but there was still a chance that there might be water. If it was inhabited, then must her approach be cautious, for only enemies might be expected to abide in so far distant a land. Tara of Helium knew that she must be far from the twin cities of her grandfather's empire, but had she guessed within a thousand heads of the reality, she had been stunned by realization of the utter hopelessness of her state. Keeping the craft low, for the buoyancy tanks were still intact, the girl skimmed the ground until the gently moving wind had carried her to the side of the last hill that intervened between her and the structure she had thought a man-built tower. Here she brought the flyer to the ground among some stunted trees, and dragging it beneath one where it might be somewhat hidden from craft passing above, she made it fast and set forth to reconnoiter. Like most women of her class, she was armed only with a single slender blade, so that in such an emergency as now confronted her she must depend almost solely upon her cleverness in remaining undiscovered by enemies. With utmost caution she crept warily toward the crest of the hill, taking advantage of every natural screen that the landscape afforded to conceal her approach from possible observers ahead, while momentarily she cast quick glances rearward lest she be taken by surprise from that quarter. She came at last to the summit where, from the concealment of a low bush, she could see what lay beyond. 
Beneath her spread a beautiful valley, surrounded by low hills. Dotting it were numerous circular towers, dome-capped, and surrounding each tower was a stone wall enclosing several acres of ground. The valley appeared to be in a high state of cultivation. Upon the opposite side of the hill and just beneath her was a tower and enclosure. It was the roof of the former that had first attracted her attention. In all respects it seemed identical in construction with those further out in the valley, a high, plastered wall of massive construction surrounding a similarly constructed tower, upon whose gray surface was painted in vivid colors a strange device. The towers were about forty sofads in diameter, approximately forty earth feet, and sixty in height to the base of the dome. To an earth man they would have immediately suggested the silos in which dairy farmers store and silage for their herds, the closer scrutiny revealing an occasional embrasured opening together with the strange construction of the domes would have altered such a conclusion. Tara of Helium saw that the domes seemed to be faced with innumerable prisms of glass, those that were exposed to the declining sun scintillating so gorgeously as to remind her suddenly of the magnificent trappings of Gahan of Gathol. As she thought of the man she shook her head angrily and moved cautiously forward a foot or two that she might get a less obstructed view of the nearer tower and its enclosure. As Tara of Helium looked down into the enclosure surrounding the nearest tower her brows contracted momentarily in frowning surprise, and then her eyes went wide in an expression of incredulity, tinged with horror, for what she saw was a score or two of human bodies, naked and headless. For a long moment she watched, breathless, unable to believe the evidence of her own eyes, that these gruesome things moved and had life. She saw them crawling about on hands and knees over and across one another, searching about with their fingers, and she saw some of them at troughs, for which the others seemed to be searching, and those at the troughs were taking something from these receptacles and apparently putting it in a hole where their necks should have been. They were not far beneath her. She could see them distinctly, and she saw that there were the bodies of both men and women and that they were beautifully proportioned, and that their skin was similar to hers, but of a slightly lighter red. At first she had thought that she was looking upon a shambles, and that the bodies, but recently decapitated, were moving under the impulse of muscular reaction. But presently she realized that this was their normal condition. The horror of them fascinated her, so that she could scarce take her eyes from them. It was evident from their groping hands that they were eyeless, and their sluggish movements suggested a rudimentary nervous system and a correspondingly minute brain. The girl wondered how they subsisted, for she could not, even by the wildest stretch of imagination, picture these imperfect creatures as intelligent tillers of the soil. Yet that the soil of the valley was tilled was evident, and that these things had food was equally so. But who tilled the soil? Who kept and fed these unhappy things, and for what purpose? It was an enigma beyond her powers of deduction. The sight of food aroused again a consciousness of her own gnawing hunger and the thirst that parched her throat. She could see both food and water within the enclosure, but would she dare enter even should she find means of ingress? She doubted it, since the very thought a possible contact with these gruesome creatures sent a shudder through her frame. Then her eyes wandered again out across the valley until presently they picked out what appeared to be a tiny stream winding its way through the center of the farmlands, a strange sight upon Barsoom. Ah, if it were but water! Then might she hope with a real hope, for the fields would give her sustenance which she could gain by night while by day she hid among the surrounding hills, and sometime, yes, sometime she knew, the searchers would come, for John Carter, warlord of Barsoom, would never cease to search for his daughter, 
until every square hod of the planet had been combed again and again. She knew him, and she knew the warriors of Helium, and so she knew that could she but manage to escape harm until they came, they would indeed come at last. She would have to wait until dark before she dare venture into the valley, and in the meantime she thought it well to search out a place of safety nearby where she might be reasonably safe from savage beasts. It was possible that the district was free from carnivora, but one might never be sure in a strange land. As she was about to withdraw behind the brow of the hill, her attention was again attracted to the enclosure below. Two figures had emerged from the tower. Their beautiful bodies seemed identical with those of the headless creatures among which they moved, but the newcomers were not headless. Upon their shoulders were heads that seemed human, yet which the girl intuitively sensed were not human. They were just a trifle too far away for her to see them distinctly in the waning light of the dying day. But she knew that they were too large, they were out of proportion to the perfectly proportioned bodies, and they were oblate in form. She could see that the men wore some manner of harness to which were slung the customary long sword and short sword of the Barsoomian warrior, and that about their short necks were massive leather collars cut to fit closely over the shoulders and snugly to the lower part of the head. Their features were scarce discernible, but there was a suggestion of grotesqueness about them that carried to her a feeling of revulsion. The two carried a long rope to which were fastened at intervals of about two sofads what she later guessed to be light manacles for she saw the warriors passing among the poor creatures in the enclosure, and about the right wrist of each they fastened one of the manacles. When all had been thus fastened to the rope, one of the warriors commenced to pull and tug at the loose end, as though attempting to drag the headless company toward the tower, while the other went among them with a long, light whip with which he flicked them upon the naked skin. Slowly, dully, the creatures rose to their feet and between the tugging of the warrior in the front and the lashing of him behind the hopeless band was finally herded within the tower. Tara of Helium shuddered as she turned away. What manner of creatures were these? Suddenly it was night. The Barsoomian day had ended, and then the brief period of twilight that renders the transition from daylight to darkness almost as abrupt as the switching off of an electric light and Tara of Helium had found no sanctuary. But perhaps there were no beasts to fear, or rather to avoid. Tara of Helium liked not the word fear. She would have been glad, however, had there been a cabin, even a very tiny cabin, upon her small flyer, but there was no cabin. The interior of the hull was completely taken up by the buoyancy tanks. Ah, she had it! How stupid of her not to have thought of it before! She could moor the craft to a tree beneath which it rested and let it rise the length of the rope. Lashed to the deck rings, she would then be safe from any roaming beast of prey that chanced along. In the morning she could drop to the ground again before the craft was discovered. As Tara of Helium crept over the brow of the hill down toward the valley, her presence was hidden by the darkness of night from the sight of any chance observer who might be loitering by a window in the nearby tower. Chloros, the farther moon, was just rising above the horizon to commence his leisurely journey through the heavens. Eight zodes later he would set, a trifle over nineteen and a half earth hours, and during that time Thuria, his vivacious mate, would have circled the planet twice and be more than halfway around on her third trip she had but just set. It would be more than three and a half hours before she shot above the opposite horizon to hurtle, swift and low, across the face of the dying planet. During this temporary absence of the mad moon Tara of Helium hoped to find both food and water, and gain again the safety of her flyer's deck. She groped her way through the darkness, giving the tower and its enclosure as wide a berth as possible. Sometimes she stumbled, for in the long shadows cast by the rising Chloros, 
objects were grotesquely distorted, though the light from the moon was still not sufficient to be of much assistance to her. Nor, as a matter of fact, did she want light. She could find the stream in the dark by the simple expedient of going downhill until she walked into it, and she had seen that bearing trees and many crops grew throughout the valley, so that she would pass food in plenty ere she reached the stream. If the moon showed her the way more clearly, and thus saved her from an occasional fall, he would, too, show her more clearly to the strange denizens of the towers, and that, of course, must not be. Could she have waited until the following night, conditions would have been better, since Chloros would not appear in the heavens at all, and so, during Thuria's absence, utter darkness would reign. But the pangs of thirst, and the gnawing of hunger, could be endured no longer with food and drink both in sight, and so she had decided to risk discovery rather than suffer longer. Safely past the nearest tower, she moved as rapidly as she felt consistent with safety, choosing her way wherever possible so that she might take advantage of the shadows of the trees that grew at intervals and at the same time discover those which bore fruit. In this latter she met with almost immediate success, for the very third tree beneath which she halted was heavy with ripe fruit. Never, thought Tara of Helium, had aught so delicious impinged upon her palate, and yet it was naught else than the almost tasteless usa, which is considered to be palatable only after having been cooked and highly spiced. It grows easily, with little irrigation and the trees bear abundantly. The fruit, which ranks high in food value, is one of the staple foods of the less well-to-do, and because of its cheapness and nutritive value forms one of the principal rations of both armies and navies upon Barsoom, a use which has won for it a Martian sobriquet which, freely translated into English, would be the fighting potato. The girl was wise enough to eat but sparingly but she filled her pocket pouch with the fruit before she continued upon her way. Two towers she passed before she came at last to the stream, and here again was she temperate, drinking but little, and that very slowly, contenting herself with rinsing her mouth frequently and bathing her face, her hands, and her feet. And even though the night was cold, as Martian nights are, the sensation of refreshment more than compensated for the physical discomfort of the low temperature. Replacing her sandals, she sought among the growing tract near the stream for whatever edible berries or tubers might be planted there, and found a couple of varieties that could be eaten raw. With these, she replaced some of the usa in her pocket pouch, not only to ensure a variety, but because she found them more palatable. Occasionally, she returned to the stream to drink, but each time, moderately, always were her eyes and ears alert for the first signs of danger, but she had neither seen nor heard aught to disturb her. And presently the time approached when she felt she must return to her flyer lest she be caught in the revealing light of low-swinging Thuria. She dreaded leaving the water, for she knew that she must become very thirsty before she could hope to come again to the stream. If she only had some little receptacle in which to carry water, even a small amount would tide her over until the following night, but she had nothing, and so she must content herself as best she could with the juices of the fruit and the tubers she had gathered. After a last drink at the stream, the longest and deepest she had allowed herself, she rose to retrace her steps toward the hills, but even as she did so, she became suddenly tense with apprehension. What was that? She could have sworn that she saw something move in the shadows beneath a tree not far away. For a long minute the girl did not move. She scarce breathed. Her eyes remained fixed upon the dense shadows below the tree. Her ears strained through the silence of the night. A low moaning came down from the hills where her flyer was hidden. She knew it well. The weird note of the hunting banth and the great carnivore lay directly in her path. But he was not so close 
as this other thing, hiding there in the shadows just a little way off. What was it? It was the strain of uncertainty that weighed heaviest upon her. Had she known the nature of the creature lurking there, half its menace would have been vanished. She cast quickly about her, in search of some haven of refuge, should the thing prove dangerous. Again arose the moaning from the hills, but this time closer. Almost immediately it was answered from the opposite side of the valley, behind her, and then from the distance to the right of her, and twice upon her left. Her eyes had found a tree quite near. Slowly, and without taking her eyes from the shadows of that other tree, she moved toward the overhanging branches that might afford her sanctuary in the event of need, and at her first move a low growl rose from the spot she had been watching, and she heard the sudden moving of a big body. Simultaneously the creature shot into the moonlight in full charge upon her, its tail erect, its tiny ears laid flat, its great mouth with its multiple rows of sharp and powerful fangs already yawning for its prey, its ten legs carrying it forward in great leaps, and now from the beast's throat issued the frightful roar upon which it seeks to paralyze its prey. It was a banth, the great maned lion of Barsoom. Tara of Helium saw it coming and leaped for the tree toward which she had been moving, and the banth realized her intention and redoubled his speed. As his hideous roar awakened the echoes in the hills, so too it awakened echoes in the valley, but these echoes came from the living throats of others of his kind, until it seemed to the girl that fate had thrown her into the midst of a countless multitude of these savage beasts. Almost incredibly swift is the speed of a charging banth, and fortunate it was that the girl had not been caught farther in the open. As it was, her margin of safety was next to negligible, for as she swung nimbly to the lower branches the creature in pursuit of her crashed among the foliage, almost upon her as it sprang upward to seize her. It was only a combination of good fortune and agility that saved her. A stout branch deflected the raking talons of the carnivore, but so close was the call that a giant forearm brushed her flesh in the instant before she scrambled to the higher branches. Baffled, the banth gave vent to his rage and disappointment in a series of frightful roars that caused the very ground to tremble, and to these were added the roarings and the growlings and the moanings of his fellows as they approached from every direction in hope of wresting from him whatever of his kill they could take by craft or proudness, and now he turned, snarling upon them as they circled the tree, while the girl huddled in a crotch above them, looked down upon the gaunt yellow monsters padding on noiseless feet in a restless circle about her. She wondered now at the strange freak of fate that had permitted her to come down this far into the valley by night, unharmed, but even more she wondered how she was to return to the hills. She knew that she would not dare venture it by night, and she guessed, too, that by day she might be confronted by even graver perils. To depend upon this valley for sustenance she now saw to be beyond the pale of possibility, because of the bonds that would keep her from food and water by night, while the dwellers in the towers would doubtless make it equally impossible for her to forage by day. There was but one solution of her difficulty, and that was to return to her flyer and pray that the wind would waft her to some less terrible land. But when might she return to the flyer? The banths gave little evidence of relinquishing hope of her, and even if they wandered out of sight, would she dare risk the attempt? She doubted it. Hopeless indeed seemed her situation. Hopeless it was. This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter 3, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Recording by Tom Weiss.